I'm Jay Pitts, a real estate broker, agent, leader, and investor. For the last decade, I've navigated the craziest of real estate markets this country has ever seen, selling over 2,000 homes, moving in and out of markets, always ahead of the curve. And now I'm bringing that perspective to you. This is your resource, and Real Talk About Real Estate starts right now. And we're back, folks. Welcome back to Resource Real Talk about Louisville Real Estate. I am your host, broker owner of Remax Premier Properties, leader of JT Pitts and Associates. I suppose I should have said my name at the front of that. I am Jay Pitts. Welcome back to Resource. It's Wednesday. The sun has peaked through the clouds, still a little gray, and the April snow has melted. I guess they knew we were bringing some fire to the podcast today. Not real sure about that, but uh, I am, as a mentor of mine would say, alive, excited, and full of energy. And I'm, I'm going to give you some very, very useful information today. But let's pay the bills first. As always, reminder, you can get us via our private Facebook group, live episodes going on Facebook right now, Facebook group resource, Real Talk About Louisville Real Estate. It is searchable. If you are a real estate agent in the Louisville area, you can request access. We will grant that. Not always the fastest, but I will get you in, get you in on the conversation. Please request. We would love to have you. Uh, YouTube.com slash J Pitts Realtor for uh, full episodes. Um, You know, you can also find clips, shareable clips, and links to full audio episodes on facebook.com slash jpitsrealtor. Uh, Appreciate, you know, all of you checking us out in the various podcast platforms, wherever you podcast. Specifically, though, on iTunes, please like, share, subscribe. Uh, that helps us get the metrics moving in the direction that we need them to go, gets us you know, accessible and visible to more people. But you can also find us, and in case you weren't sure what I meant, iTunes is also the Apple Podcast app on your iOS device. You can also find us on Spotify. You can find us on Amazon Podcasts, Stitcher, iHeart, pretty much anywhere you podcast. You um you know, best way to find us is just search my name, Jay Pitts. Sometimes the parentheses around the RE and resource gets you tripped up when you search, but you can search resource, real talk, or my name, Jay Pitts, on any of those platforms. Uh, IG and Twitter, Instagram and Twitter is where we share lots of information, um, not just pictures of my kids. But uh, you'll get snippets of the podcast, two weekly that get shared via our reels and some IGTV episodes. Uh, that's at J Pitts Realtor on IG and Twitter. Also TikTok J underscore Pitts. We're we're circulating clips for the show there as well. Feel free to to like, share, subscribe as well. And don't forget our second piece of content that we're producing on a weekly basis, putting out for you. Um, to kind of use directly implement into your business on a daily basis or on a weekly basis, I should say, JTP University. We've gotten great feedback on that. Also, you know, you can interact with us through any of these platforms. You can find me directly. I'm not hard to find. Um, You can text the show. Seth, give me the text. Give me the text number one more time, man. I don't have it written down on my sheet here. 502-705. Five six, six seven. I thought that might have been it, but anyway, that's five zero two seven zero five five six six seven, and I'm pretty sure Seth's going to throw it up on the screen here in a moment. Um, interact with us however you like. Uh, give us ideas, ideas for episodes that you would like us to do here, topics here in the Resource Podcast, long form, 30 minutes, or even five-minute episodes that we can do JTP University. We're always interested in knowing what information you would like. So anyway, I feel like I botched the intro, um, but you know, it is what it is. It's my show, so you know, I guess we'll just have to deal with it. Uh, my notebook, my handy-dandy, trusty notebook ran out of pages, so I busted out a new one today and had to rewrite my opening. Uh, forgot the text line, so we'll get that added. Um, I think I gave the wrong Facebook link, but you know, who cares? You'll find us 
Um, you know what's up. Uh, which is a perfect segue because as it pertains to anything, broadcasting, content creation, and real estate, there's always a good, a bad, and an ugly. I think today's opening was the ugly. Um, the good is hopefully the value you find in this podcast. The bad is just kind of like my jokes, I would imagine. Um, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kick it off today with the good, bad, and ugly of the real estate business. Now, as you can imagine, and as I've shared on the show here, I mentor on a daily basis approximately about 50 agents, 80 total here in the brokerage, but about 50 agents that have been in the business less than, say, two years. Um, that's the kind of growth we've seen here at Remax Premier Properties. We've seen a lot of growth at JT Pitts and Associates. Uh, we added 18 agents in Q, Q4 of 2020, 18 agents. So pretty substantial growth. And the majority of those agents are new to the industry. We've talked ad nauseum on the podcast about how 2020 and the coronavirus pandemic took and was it was not equitable in the way it attacked certain industries. The economy had more or less a V-shaped recovery. Real estate had a much steeper V-shaped recovery. We saw almost no slowdown whatsoever. I mean, maybe two weeks, maybe a month of time last April, March, April, where, you know, the business kind of slowed down. But uh, the pandemic has driven real estate sales. The, the real estate market has been a beneficiary of the changes here. A lot of folks that were in hospitality in the restaurant industry that were in, you know, any sort of service economy that was hurt by the pandemic, a lot of those possess the same skills that are necessary to be successful in real estate, had a mindset that they would eventually try out real estate and ultimately pulled the trigger while they were sitting at home with little other option but to take online coursework and get a real estate license. So the 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 need for today's show and today's discussion, in my mind, it stems from the conversations that I'm having with individuals who have shown us their trust and chosen this as their brokerage, um, things that they have yet to be able to learn in the 6, 12, or even 24 months they've been in the business. Um, they've learned some of it, and, and I'll talk a little bit about the market today and you know certain challenges or certain um, you know, exciting things that happen as it relates to the market, but also the individuals who have yet to take the plunge. You need to know before you decide to invest thousands of dollars, because that's what the upfront cost is, and substantial time, energy, effort, and truthfully, loss of income in a current job, you need to know these things before you get in. So today I'm going to give you the three things good three things bad, and three things ugly about the real estate business. And I'll bring it for a full circle here in the end. So number one, to kick things off on the good list, and I promise you it's not going to be Debbie Downer, right? Those who have seen that Rachel Dratch, you know, uh, Saturday Night Live <laughs> skit with Debbie Downer. Seth looks a little bit, a little bit confused here. This is before his time. Um, there's not going to be any, like, you know, plants like laying over with the negative energy here. I'll tie it all back together in a positive way, as I always do. So number one, uh, and it just so happens to be the single greatest reason cited for why people get into the real estate industry. The good is that you get to make your own schedule. You get to make your own schedule. There's no boss. Well, there's kind of a boss. I'm kind of the boss. Um, but, but that boss doesn't fire you. I mean, they can, they can, but it's not typical. Um, your, your boss in real estate is your broker or your team lead, but, but mainly your broker. Your broker is the one who's accountable to the, to the real estate commission or the regulatory body in your state that says that I agree to supervise this person who really doesn't know what they're doing just yet. Um, and I'm going to usher them through the industry and help them, help them learn. But the broker, you know, in in the majority, there are a couple of employee, employer, real estate agencies throughout the country, um, but but the vast majority are 1099 
independent contractor agreements, right? Where there's a contract between the broker or the owner of the firm and the independent contractor that says this is how we conduct our business. And as such, you make your own schedule. You decide when you're going to work and when you're not. You decide how much you're going to work, how hard you're going to work. You decide, you know, what pursuits you're going to follow. You decide what the most profitable ways to spend what capital you have to invest. You determine your 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 expenses. You determine really what segment of the market you're going to pursue. You make your own schedule though. And the majority of people questioned about why they get in the industry cite the very simple I get to make my own schedule, which is a, a akin to no two days are the same, which they really aren't. No two, two days are the same in real estate. So that's number one. You get to make your own schedule. If you would rather work, you know, from your kitchen table in sweatpants, making phone calls to clients, um, or processing transactions, if you'd rather go to the gym at 9 a.m. and work out until 1130, if you'd rather be at the office at 6 a.m. or get up like I do at 530 in the morning and get a couple of hours of work in before anybody else is working, you can make that choice as a self-employed individual, which takes me as a nice segue into number two. When you're a real estate agent, you're basically a business owner. So, you know, everybody, I would say, most everybody, I mean, I don't, I don't know anybody that's a real estate agent that this was their first job. You can't get licenses until you're 18, and I think most people have a job before then. And, you know, it's a really nice second career for people, in fact. So most people come from other work environments. I think that's safe to say. Most people come from another work environment. Me, I've, I've always been around real estate, but I was in the mortgage business before this. And before that, I worked a number of jobs. You know, I you know, worked in a HVAC parts warehouse downtown as a college student, you know, driving a forklift and doing things that I probably shouldn't have because I was a young college kid and they you know, didn't mind to stick me up on the forklift and raise me up with no harness to the third floor of this, you know, clear span warehouse to grab a 60 pound compressor off the shelf and then ride down with it. I think OSHA would love to hear that. I won't, I won't name the name of the company that did that to me, but I didn't get hurt. I was fine. And I was proud to do it. To be, to be frank, I was happy to have a job. I was happy they trusted me. Uh, But that's neither here nor there. You are a business owner when you're in real estate, which, which means, Literally, maybe on a smaller scale, maybe on a larger scale, who knows, but but mainly on a smaller scale, you have income, you have expense, you have policies, you have procedures, you have laws and guidelines and stipulations that you have to follow, you have a reputation, you have all of these things that precede you, all of these requirements of you, you know, you have things, stuff that takes focus away from the thing that you probably enjoy most about what it is that you do as a real estate agent. But all of that breeds pride, pride of ownership in that business that you are the proprietor of. Now, you can be on a team, you're still a business owner. You can be in a brokerage, and still be a business owner. That is incumbent, and that is the good attached to being in the real estate industry. Being a business owner and having the pride, knowing that every single effort you put forth is building something bigger for yourself. Every review that you get on Google or Zillow or you know whatever platform, Yelp, for example, Facebook page, every, every social media post, whether it be business or professional, you're, you're, you're a business owner that interacts with people personally. Your personal brand, 
you know, we talked about brand engagement marketing a couple weeks ago. Your personal brand helps build your business that you own, that no one else does. If you leave that team, if you strike out on your own, if you open your own brokerage, your rep reputation precedes you because the agent is who moves the needle with sphere of influence clients. You're a business owner. You should act like it. Number three on the good list. I kind of feel like kid on Santa's lap with the with the nice list going on. I'm coming with the naughty list here in a minute, but um, like I said, trust me, we're gonna we're gonna tie it back into positivity. Um, nearly limitless income. Nearly limitless. I could say limitless. I could say there is no ceiling, as most people say. Um, but really, there is always a ceiling. Okay? Even if that ceiling is your own imagination, your own limiting beliefs, that I'll never make more than X, but I can tell you this, um, I've seen it in my own personal career, I've seen it in countless others that I've mentored, that never, ever, ever expected to make more than a certain amount. For me, the number was $100,000. When I, when I was in the mortgage business, um, I thought, you know what, if I made 100000 in a year, the world's problems would be solved for me. Like, that would be it, just 100000 And that was until I realized that um, it costs money to make money, I didn't. I, I realized it, but I didn't learn the lesson just then. I made a hundred thousand. My taxes went up. My expenses went up. My personal expenses went up, and I had really not much more to show for it than when I made fifty thousand a year. Just to be frank. Um, and then I got into you know real estate, and and I made very close to a hundred thousand in gross commissions in my first year, which was a pay cut from the year prior in the mortgage business. Cause I'd gotten to about 150 K as a W2 employee as in the mortgage business. And, um, I realized that a hundred thousand as a self-employed person was worth about a 30% bump from being an employed person. So that was, that was nice to learn, but it still wasn't enough. And, you know, then 250, then 500. And, you know, gross commissions is not what your income is. Everybody should know that. If you see a real estate agent that makes a million dollars a year in gross commissions, they did not put anywhere near a million dollars in their pocket. That's not what happened. It costs a lot of money to do this. Okay. So the point being is that it doesn't matter what the number is. This industry can change your life. It mostly change your, changes your life by changing the perspective you have for money. And what you need to realize is that income, when you're a self-employed person, is not what it means when you're, when you're a W-2 wage earner. And may, mainly, that's the simple, simple concept that business owners learn of income and expense. Income and expense, you know, a simple P&L calculation. Um, you know, top line does not equal bottom line. But the top line is nearly limitless. It really is. And you can change your life when you start understanding that money is a construct, okay? It's a way to get what you want out of life. Now, it's the easiest, most direct uh, scorecard, if you will. It's the easiest, most obvious scorecard is that top line revenue. You hear a CEO talk about business, they talk about top line versus bottom line. Top line revenue is gross commission income. Gross, not net. Okay, your net income that goes on your tax return is your gross income, or gross commission income, less whatever expense you spent in the process. And that's what you owe tax on. But that limitless top line is, a, is, is, is part of the good. It's part of the good because, it, and this is going to make a nice segue into the bad here in a moment, but 
that limitless top line teaches you, once again, that money is a construct. It is a tool among many tools to live the life that you'd like to live. All right, that, that, that does it for the good today. We're going to get all negative on you now. Let's go to the bad. And as I just discussed, money, revenue, income is all a construct. And it's a construct, it's a tool that allows you to live the life that you want to live. And the bad that most people don't understand, first and foremost, when they enter this business, this industry, is that success does not necessarily look like they, ex they expect it to. In fact, uh, I say things like, it gets harder before it gets easier. And that's impossibly simple for a lot of people to grasp. It's, it's overly simplified. It's almost obtuse. Frankly, it is obtuse. That's exactly what it is. That's a good word. Um, those of you that don't remember sophomore year geometry, look, look up what an obtuse angle is. Um, it's obtuse to say it gets harder before it gets easier, but it's also absolutely true. Um, and, and you could also say that success doesn't look like you expect it to. You get in this industry to make your own schedule, to be a business owner, to have limitless income, and then you realize that the pursuit of all of those things, not even attaining them, the pursuit of all of those things changes your life in a way that you didn't expect and really probably don't appreciate at first. You know, it's part of the reason why I do this podcast is to share this information with people so they don't make the mistakes that I have made. Whether you're with me or you're, you know, at another firm or in another city or just listening because you've Googled me and you think I have something to say about real estate and I live in your area. Uh, I do get your messages, by the way. Thank you very much. It's very humbling that you might reach out to me over email or DM or what have you. I do this because I don't want you to make those mistakes. I don't want you to suffer those consequences. I don't want you to wake up and realize that you have become someone who is held hostage by your business. You're doing as much as you can, as hard as you can. You've become efficient. You've pulled every lever. You've bought every software. You've spent the money. You've done everything you can, and you're just not living the life that you want to live. Success does not look like what you expect it to. If you make $250,000 a year in gross commission, spend $100,000 to do it so that you can work with 75 clients instead of 50 clients or 40 clients, and they're not so happy with your service, your family doesn't like you because you haven't been to you know, family dinner in a while, you, you are stressed out, you drink too much, you have too much caffeine, you're irritable, you're short-tempered, What's the point? What's the point? Success doesn't always look like you expect it to at first. It often looks like imbalance more than it looks like balance. And that stems from the incredible amount of accessibility that real estate agents have. The expectation that a good one is always available. It doesn't matter what else is important to you. And that kind of brings me to a, the next bad, which is that there are no guarantees. And just as you have put it all on the line, saw some positive motion, some success as you expected it to look, and made some pivots, some changes, you know, hit the you know, some of those contingency plans because it wasn't exactly what you thought, the business dries up like that. 
and you don't know where your next transaction is coming from. But that 12-month contract on those $3,000 a month lead sources, well, that is going to be due next month. And the assistant you just hired, their bills have to get paid. Your broker wants the office rent. The grass has got to get cut at your house, and you got to pay somebody to do it because you're out showing houses all day, every day, and you don't have time to cut your own grass. You're eating out more than you wanted, so you put on 10 pounds, and it costs twice as much, and you don't know where the income's coming from. There's no guarantees, and there's a lot of anxiety that comes from that. I can tell you some of the most successful agents I know who have mastered the success looking different. They've turned imbalance into balance. They've limited their accessibility and gained back, reclaimed their home life, their personal life, and their balance. And they still call me and say, Jay, I'm so, I'm, it's so slow right now. What? You have 12 pendings and you're in the busiest real estate market in the history of real estate and you're slow? You have 12 pendings. Oh, I know it was 15 last month. My point is, is it never goes away. It takes a lot of fortitude. It takes a lot of self-confidence to trust yourself because you're lone wolf in it. Even if you've got a team, one person makes the decisions. One person makes the choices. There are no guarantees in this business. Number three, fulfillment. It's another perfect step. I'm killing the segue game today, Seth. Fulfillment is rarely obtained. It's rarely obtained. Most of that is not the industry's fault. It's the individuals that are drawn to and have success in the industry. It's how we're wired. It's never good enough. I will be honest. There's not an amount of money that I could make that would be enough for me. And it's not about what I can buy. It's not about what I need. I don't take lavish trips or vacations. I don't buy fancy cars. I am buying a Cybertruck, but that's actually not even, that's less expensive than an F-150. I don't do things that take a lot of money. It's about the chase for me. Now, I hadn't really planned to discuss Napoleon Hill today, but in his seminal book, Think and Grow Rich, he says, as one of the four things required to get anything you want at life, it ha- requires an unending, burning desire to achieve that, whatever it is. And that fire, that desire, that motivation, it burns real hot inside me. So there's nothing No amount is enough. If the scoreboard was different, I would want whatever the scoreboard is. And there's a few differences. We talk about lead versus lag measures. Home sold, number of homes. I want to sell 1,000 houses in a year on my team. 1,000. That number, I'm obsessed with that number right now. Obsessed with it. To me, it's not good enough unless it's 10x what I think I can do. And that's really just the realization that even that's not good enough. It's just a number that I don't expect to hit. You know, Michael Jordan used to make up stories in his mind about the person that was guarding him or the the opponent in the next playoff series. Literally make up things. Hear things that did not happen and use it to fuel him. And I'm not comparing myself to Michael Jordan by any means. I mean, he was... The general, I'm not even going to go there. Somebody's going to tell me that LeBron's better and I'll lose my mind. Michael Jordan is the best athlete that has ever lived at his sport. Period. End of story. Don't come at me, bro. I will not discuss this with you. 
my point is, is I admire the gentleman. Not, not everything about him. He had some serious flaws, still does. Um, but his ability to manufacture motivation to achieve his outcome is something that I, I can't even put into words. And most of the really successful people in this industry have the same characteristics. Maybe not to that level. Kobe had it, which is why it was so, such a disappointment to lose him so early. But that was inspired by Jordan and no one else. Okay? There are people in this industry that do very well for themselves, that have found a way to live a life that is fulfilled. But it's still not enough if you ask them. It's still not. And that's the bad. Fulfillment is rarely obtained. All right, let's talk about the ugly. And I see that I'm, I'm, I'm nearing my, my cap in terms of uh, the, the time that I want to keep you. So I'll get through it pretty quick. Because I think I, I went a little long on the bad, and I don't want to make it any worse. But um, the truth is, you're at the mercy of the market here. Now, on the converse, you can always beat the market. But in the last 12 months, we've learned more than ever that we are at the mercy of the market. We saw the lowest low for probably six to eight weeks, maybe less, and we've seen the highest high. But the highest high comes at a challenge. I had a great conversation with one of my agents this morning who has been on fire. She's been in the business three months. Had a seven pending week earlier this year. Seven accepted contracts in a week. It's incredible. Like, it didn't get better than that. And in the last 48 hours has had a deal bust uh, on inspection, which was a really good price point for her. She's had uh, a buyer miss out on a fourth offer, which is also a seller who is now debating whether they should sell and move at all and potentially going to refinance their house. So let's talk $500,000 pending, $400,000 purchase, $300,000 listing. You do the math at three points. What kind of income loss and what kind of swing and range of emotion that she's dealing with? And I just said, look, there's no answer. I'm not going to tell you that it's okay. I'm not going to tell you that it's never going to happen again. You're at the mercy of the market. These things tend to come in bunches, both good and bad. And I said, you remember when you had seven accepted contracts in a week? That's not typical either. You're kicking ass. Don't get me wrong. And yes, maybe these are some bad beats going on. But that wasn't typical the same as this isn't. Won't be the first and probably not going to be the last. You're at the mercy of the market. The ugly failure rate of 87% over five years with an, a median income of 47000 nationwide. That's, that's high cost of living markets and low cost of living markets. I can tell you in Louisville, it's substantially less than that. I won't throw you a number. But average or median, either one, earnings for a real estate agent is not an extremely high um, standard of living. Now that's skewed because there's a lot of, a lot of part timers, but you've got to come out in that top thirteen percent to stay in the business, and you got to be in the top three or four percent to make a really good life, income wise. Now, as I always say. It's not hard, or excuse me, I always butcher this. It's not complex, but it is hard. It's simple, but it ain't easy. That was it. I did it good that time. I like my chances against my competition. That's why I stand in front of this microphone and stand in front of this camera and talk to you guys every week because I like my chances against my competition. I like your chances when you ally yourself with me against the competition. This business 
is one that can be beat. That's why there's a lot of people out there that have done very well for themselves by stepping out on their own, making their own schedule, being a business owner in pursuit of limitless income. But the last point I would like to make to you before you do that, the ugly, the biggest ugly, is also the greatest good. The majority of people who fail in real estate do so because they don't have the ability to manage their own schedule. You make your own schedule, and that's why you get in the business, but it's also what ushers you out the door. Activities produce results. Lead measures produce lag indicators. Conversations with people lead to appointments, lead to closed transactions. If you can't manage your your schedule, like my grandmother said, don't let the door hit you where the good Lord split you. Seth was mouthing that as I was saying it. (laughs) He knew it was coming. Um, If you can't manage your schedule, you can't be a realtor. You can't be a broker. You can't be in this business. You can't be a business owner. And it takes me all the way back to my team retreat at the beginning of this year where we focused on discipline. You know what to do. All you got to do is do it. You know what buttons have to be pushed. All you got to do is push them. One foot in front of the other, day after day. It is simple, but it ain't easy. You got to have that discipline. All right, folks, that has been the good, the bad, and the ugly of real estate. Paying the bills one more time. Don't forget us. Facebook group, private Facebook group for local real estate agents here in Louisville, Kentucky. Resource, real talk about Louisville real estate. Ask and you shall receive. We'll get you in on the conversation. YouTube.com slash Realtors for full video episodes. Um, go to the Facebook page for links to full episodes, clips that you can share. You can follow, like, subscribe, review via iTunes, Apple Podcasts. Please, I will uh, shake your hand later for throwing us some love on that platform. Spotify, Amazon, Stitcher, and iHeart if you are not an iOS user. Uh, you can find me on Instagram and Twitter at Realtor on TikTok, J underscore Pitts. And don't forget to check out JTP University on uh, wherever you platform, wherever you podcast, whatever platform you're on. We like to kind of spread the content around Make sure it's accessible to you. We've gotten a lot of great feedback of late. Keep it coming. We would love to hear your ideas for episodes, things you would like me to address here on the podcast. Once again, for resource, real talk about Louisville real estate, I am your host, Jay Pitts. We'll see you next Wednesday. Thank you so much.